Many years ago, I was preaching in a congregation in a small rural town in the southeastern United States, and I don't know how it came up in the sermon, but I made some comments about the Confederate flag during that time. I said the Confederate flag was a symbol of division, slavery, and racism. I stated that the flag belonged in a museum or pictured in a history book, but that it didn't belong on the roof of cars or in people's front yards or flying from a flagpole at the courthouse. Well, I saw and heard a lot of murmuring from the congregation. Uh, then after the service, as a group of people approached me and let me know that the Confederate flag was not any of the things which I had said. They loudly let me know that it was a symbol of heritage and culture and that I had deeply offended them. Well, I managed to get to my car after church <laughs> and uh, drive away. Uh, Thankfully, they didn't try to throw me off a cliff, but evidently I had struck a nerve and made a lot of folks angry. Now, my sermons are posted on YouTube, as many of you know, and every now and then I get some angry comments from viewers, and usually they're angry about that I believe in the Trinity. They're angry that I said that Jesus is God. Are they angry that I say certain Old Testament laws like the Sabbath and the holy days and the kosher meats do not have to be observed today? And that makes some people angry that I've said those things. Sometimes preachers and sermons step on toes. And some folks in the congregation get very upset. Well, that's what happened in our story for today about Jesus preaching in the synagogue at Nazareth from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. And we're going to take a look at that today, but first, we'll get the context for what happened there. Earlier in chapter 4, as you may remember from last week, Jesus had been asked to read in the synagogue from the scroll of Isaiah and then comment on the readings. In other words, give a sermon. So this was Jesus preaching in the synagogue at Nazareth from I, the book of Isaiah. So Jesus read what Isaiah said, and Jesus read about the restoration of God's people, about being freed from captivity by the one whom God had anointed, the Messiah. He read of the acceptable year of the Lord, and good news for the poor, and healing, and forgiveness of debts, and the congregation loved his message so far. Then Jesus went off in a different direction. And the sermon was not so well received. That's where we pick up our story today in Luke chapter 4, verse 21. In Luke chapter 4, verse 21, this is the end of the sermon from Jesus on that day. After having read the selection from the scroll of Isaiah, Jesus began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, the acceptable year of the Lord has come. But what he also was saying is, I am the Messiah. I am the anointed one that Isaiah spoke of. And the people who heard him thought, well, that's really good if it's true, if we can believe what he's saying. And so in verse 22, all spoke well of him. They had witnessed this and they testified to what he said in a very positive way. And they were amazed. They had admiration at the gracious words, the words of grace, the words of charm, the eloquence with which he had delivered the message. But then they said, wait, wait, though. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this the son of a carpenter? 
who's a carpenter himself. You know, I really liked his message, but he's just a carpenter. Are, are, are we sure he knows what he's talking about? They did not understand who Jesus was. They did admire his understanding and his ability to teach, but how can he be the anointed Messiah? Like he says, he, he, he's just the son of a carpenter. And you know what? He hasn't done a thing since he's been here in Nazareth. We've heard stories, but he hadn't done anything here. Not for us. So I'm not sure about him. So Jesus saw their skeptical attitude. And Jesus said to them in verse 23, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Uh, there have been no miracles here in Nazareth. I don't see you've done any miracles for your family or for your homeboys. So I'm not so sure about you, physician, rabbi, heal yourself first. Let's, let's see what's going on here in Nazareth. Do something here, and then we'll believe you. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we've heard that you did in Capernaum. We heard it. Now I'm not so sure it's true. We heard you did miracles. Uh, haven't seen any here. So... What's going on, Jesus? Now, in Luke 4.15, he says that, that Jesus had circulated through Galilee, perhaps to Capernaum. Now he's in Nazareth, but later in this chapter, we're going to find of the significant deeds he does in Capernaum. And some people say, well, I thought Luke put everything in order. This seems a little bit out of order. Well, Luke puts everything in sequence. And the sequence that Luke wants us and his readers to understand is this is important in Jesus' ministry. I'm putting it right up front because this is going to tell you how the rest of Jesus' ministry is going to be done. So before we get into the details, let me start off with this mission statement, this sermon that Jesus preached in Nazareth. So then Jesus continues in his comments to the congregation there in the synagogue. Verse 24, truly I tell you, amen. Now, usually when do we say amen? At the end. <laughs> but Jesus says it up front. In other words, and he's the only person in scripture who does that. But he's saying, I authenticate. This is absolutely true. Let it be. Let it be so. Here's what I'm about to say. Amen. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet. So what is Jesus doing? He's identifying himself as what? A prophet. I'm a prophet. No prophet, no preacher is accepted in his hometown. Making a little play on the acceptable year of the Lord. They accept the year of the Lord, but they don't accept God's anointed. No prophet, no preacher is accepted in his hometown. He says, well, let me tell you something. Now, this is where the sermon starts stepping on toes. You know, we've liked it so far, preacher. Uh, but now we're not so sure. Jesus says, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. So he's going to tell a story from 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 through 16, about when there was a great famine in Israel that God sent his prophet uh, uh, Elijah to live with a widow on the coast uh, where the famine wasn't at least quite as bad as it was in most of Israel. And the widow was blessed for taking Elijah in. She had no shortage of flour, no shortage of oil. Her son became sick and died. Elijah raised him back to life. It was a real blessing in the life of the widow and in the life of Elijah. Now, here's the catch of the story. Listen, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. God did not send Elijah to any of the widows in Israel. 
but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. That's on the coast of Phoenicia. In other words, this woman was a Gentile. <laughs> and that's not going to play real well at the synagogue. God sent Elijah to a Gentile woman, not to anyone in Israel. How do you like that? And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha. And the Greek word there means a variety of skin diseases. And there were many people in Israel in the days of Elisha the prophet. And this is from 2 Kings 5, verses 1 through 14. Yet not one of them, not one of the Jewish people who had leprosy was healed. Only Naaman the Syrian, a Gentile. In fact, not only a Gentile, but he was, the, he was the commander of the Syrian army. He was an enemy of Israel. And so the prophet Elijah didn't reach out to those with leprosy in Israel. He went to, God sent him to, a Gentile, an enemy of Israel, and God healed him. So what are the implications of this sermon that Jesus is giving? Well, Luke shows his readers that the words of Jesus from the Old Testament prophets justify the Christian mission to the Gentiles. Wow. And remember who were Luke's readers? Gentile Christians. And the readers of Luke are probably going, right on, yes, amen. But the folks in Nazareth, <laughs> they're not so happy about what Jesus has just said. So he's talking about how God sent his prophets to the Gentiles. And they don't like it. Verse 28, all the people in the synagogue were furious, filled with fury when they heard this. They'd like to sermon up to a point, but now, doggone, he's starting to meddle in our business. What is this? What did they hear? Well, first of all, they heard that this Jesus, this carpenter, right here from our hometown, is comparing himself to Elijah and Elisha. Who does he think he is? And he's saying that God sends his prophets to the Gentiles and that other people are included in God's blessings. And they can be God's people. Well, we just can't stand that. That's just not right. That's just, that's just not good. They were furious when they heard this. So they liked his sermon so far, but now he had gone too far. He'd stepped on some toes. And it reminds me of the story, maybe you've heard this one, about uh, this little congregation got a new preacher, and he was one of those hell, fire, and brimstone preachers. And some of the people liked it. It was the proverbial little old lady sitting in the back of the congregation. She was happy to hear they were going to have a hell, fire, and brimstone preacher because some of the people in this congregation, they're just getting too loose, too loose. And so she was happy to hear this sermon. And so the preacher got into it and he said, I hear some of you have been drinking alcohol and that's got to stop right now or you're going to hell. The little old lady said, Amen, brother, preach on, preach on. And he said, and some of you have been going to movies and if you don't stop that, you're going to go to hell. The little old lady said, Oh, I love this preacher. Preach on, preach on, tell him, tell him. He said, now some of you have been playing cards. And if you don't stop playing cards, you're going to go to hell. Amen. Oh, I love this preacher. Preach on. And some of you women have been wearing makeup. And that's a sin. You're going to go to hell like Jezebel. Oh, I love this preacher. Preach on. Preach on. About that time, she took a dip of snuff, which she liked to do from time to time. <laughs> ah, boy, that feels good. And then the preacher said, and some of you little old ladies are dipping snuff and you better stop it because you're going to go to hell. She said, turned to her neighbor and said, well, will you listen to that? 
the preacher just stopped preaching and started meddling. And that's the way it happened in the synagogue at Nazareth. <laughs> that's the way sometimes it happens in the church today. So verse 29, they got up and drove him out of the town and took him out to the brow of the hill of which the town was built in order to throw him off a cliff. And what they usually did was they threw you down the cliff and then they threw stones afterwards and stoned you to death to make sure if the fall didn't kill you, the rocks would. That's what they're going to do to Jesus. Listen, you don't want to be a preacher. <laughs> it can be some dangerous work when you, when you preach. So they wanted to throw him off a cliff, but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. You know why? Well, he looked like everybody else, and it just wasn't his time, and whether God did something special, don't know, but it wasn't Jesus' time yet to die, and so he walked away. But the people wanted to throw him off a cliff. Why? Because he was middling. So what do we learn from our pericope today? Well, one thing we learned, whatever the exact timing of the event in the synagogue in Nazareth was, what Luke places it first in his account of Jesus' ministry, his public ministry, because of its importance and significance for the way Luke wants his readers to understand the ministry of Jesus. For Luke, the story is programmatic prophecy, which guides the reader's understanding of the rest of the narratives in his gospel. For Luke, as with his main character Paul in Acts, the mission is always to the Jews first, and if they reject it, then to the Gentiles. So the Jews first, then the Gentiles. And the Jewish people at that time had been offered salvation in Jesus, but most of them rejected him. And Jesus' sermon shows that from the very beginning of the preaching of the gospel, it was God's intent that it be taken to the Gentiles. Keep in mind that Luke's original readership was primarily Gentile Christians, so that was a very positive and encouraging message for them to read. And what began in the synagogue in Nazareth was the beginning of a fulfillment of Simeon's prophecy. If you remember when Mary and Joseph took uh, the child Jesus into the temple for confirmation rites and so forth, that Simeon was there and he made a prophecy. And Simeon's prophecy in Luke 2.34 said that the child Jesus was destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel and that he would face opposition. So in this story, Luke presents Jesus as both a prophet with the word of God for his people and as the anointed redeemer, the Messiah, the Christ, who does not consider himself bound to bring the gospel only to the Jewish people. Jesus foretold using Old Testament scriptures that the good news of God's favor, God's grace, and God's forgiveness, guess what, are available to all people, all people. The gospel and inclusion in the people of God is open to any person, irrespective of race, ethnicity, or national origin. All people are equal before God and equally loved by God. The gospel, guess what? Shock is even available for sinners. Yes, the gospel should be taken to sinners. Why? Well, because all have sinned. If you're going to take it to anybody, you're going to take it to a sinner. All are forgiven. What a great good news message to give. You have been forgiven. And all are included in the people of God in that sense. However, what God wants is a relationship with us. That's why he made us. That's why God created humans. He didn't have to. He wanted to. Why did he want to? because he wants to have a relationship with us. He is our creator, he made us, and he loves us. But, you know, a relationship requires a response. 
You know, if you ask someone to marry you and they say no, you say, well, I'm glad we have this wonderful relationship. No, it requires an affirmative response in order to have a relationship. The relationship must be accepted. A relationship is not a one-way street. It must be believed. It must be trusted in. And it involves a change of mind. A change of mind and heart. We call that repentance. Repentance from what? Repentance from ignorance of who Jesus is. Repentance from disobedience, from rebellion against God, and from sin. In the realization and acceptance of God's love, you've got to realize it, you've got to accept it in order to experience it. But when you do, you begin to experience God's love, God's mercy, and God's forgiveness, which he has for you. A relationship cannot be forced or coerced. I can say, I demand you love me, and if you don't, I'm going to chop your head off. You love me yet? You know, love just does not work that way. It must be accepted. It can't be just from one side. Now, God loves us, but we must come to realize that and respond to it. The response involves communication. We call that prayer, meditation, time together, and worship as a community and as individuals, fellowship and communion with God. You can't have a relationship with someone you never talk to, never see, never spend any time with. And if you want that relationship to deepen, what do you do? Communicate more, spend more time with. And that's exactly the way it works with God. As we commune with him, as we spend time with him, as we fellowship with him, as we communicate with him, our relationship deepens in our realization of it. The gospel is preached to all people, all people. And we have an important role to play in participating in that process. And all people are invited to an ever-deepening relationship with the God who loves them, all of them, no matter their race, no matter their ethnicity, no matter their national origin, and no matter that they're Sinners. God even loves sinners. Wow. What should sinners do when they realize how much God loves them? Repent of their sins. Ask. God has forgiven them, but we need to ask and receive and experience that forgiveness that God has given us. So respond. Church, what do we do? What do we do? We've got to respond. We respond. We've got to repent of our sins. Change our hearts. Change our minds. Change our behavior. Repent of our sins. Believe. Accept God's love and forgiveness and follow Jesus and walk. Walk even as he walked. We must participate actively in the ongoing life and ministry of Jesus through the Spirit. We need to share the gospel with others. This is good news for everyone. Don't keep it to yourself. Share it with others and set an example. That's challenging, isn't it? But we must set an example by departing from evil and doing what is good. So let's stop sinning by the power of the Holy Spirit let's do the best we can not because we do it to merit or to qualify or to get God's favor we have God's favor we have qualified we do have forgiveness that's not the point the point is love God and love your neighbor and respond to that love by repenting of sins and wrong behavior we need to do that now I hope I haven't meddled too much I hope no one's going to throw me off a cliff after church today. But let's understand the meaning and the significance of the message, 
the sermon that Jesus gave in that synagogue in Nazareth on that day. And let's respond, knowing that God's love is for you, for me, and for every person on the earth. Just a lot of them don't know it yet. And we need to participate with God in letting them know how much God loves them through the power of the Spirit and the life of Jesus within us, which the Spirit ministers to us. So let's understand the meaning and significance of Jesus' sermon at that uh, synagogue in Nazareth, and let's have a loving response to God's love for us. And let's appreciate even when preachers start to meddle in our lives.